West Bengal is relatively land scarce, so pressure on land is very very high. I mean, to the extent of I think five or six hundred people per square kilometer, and then land sizes are small, so. Farmers have to grow at least two to three crops in a year just to eke out a living. So intensification, there is no alternative to intensification. And this is where groundwater comes in because groundwater allows farmers to grow that third or the second crop that they would not have been able to outside of the rainy season. So the rainy season, there is no problem. There is an adequate rainfall of 1500 to 2000 millimeters. So rain fed crops are fine. Then you have a shorter winter season where you could perhaps give one or two irrigation and grow the second crop that is also not so problematic and you can use surface water sources but then all the surface water sources dry up by you reach December or January then for your third paddy crop groundwater becomes very very essential. Paddy prices were high, input costs were relatively low, diesel prices were low, it was subsidized etc. So farmers profit margins were quite favorable. So that was the time which saw the largest amount of growth in West Bengal's agriculture. Then what started happening after 90s, 1990s, mid 1990s was the fact that uh, prices of inputs kind of increased more than the output prices. So on the one side farmers profit margins were getting squeezed and by the time we come to, to so we, we could all already see that especially diesel prices were going up and farmers didn't have electricity. So what we were finding is that cultivating say the summer crop with only diesel pumps was proving to be more and more uneconomical. That is where the unhappy story started from mid 90s onwards. And on top of that there were some I would think rather um, very um, impressionist accounts of water tables dwindling because that was happening in rest of India so that discourse was kind of blindly transported to eastern India and all of a sudden there was a lot of discourse about how water tables are going down while we have used the same data that the government collected and we didn't find any significant lowering of water tables. There was no set criteria when a farmer could be refused a permit. So what was happening was the hydrogeologist in charge of the district, it was left to his personal discretion. So he thought, uh, no, I am a bit concerned of groundwater without any you know, real data and he would refuse a permit. Or maybe he thought that I could get some bribe from the farmer if I just refused him twice and the third time he comes and bribes me. So I don't think the problem was in the law per se, but as with most laws, the problem was in the implementation. First, there was in the law, nowhere does it state that A, B, C, D, these are the criteria under which a farmer would be refused a permit. So when we started looking at the refusal data, we found that the refusals were highest in some of the districts where groundwater use is the lowest. So, which just simply doesn't make sense because if there is no groundwater use, then how, how come those farmers were being refused permits? We were talking to the electricity department officials and they said that they are getting an increased volume of applications for new connections. So they have already since uh, November they would have got some 30 40,000 connection new applications for new connections which is very unusual because in the whole year they have been used to giving not more than three or four thousand new connections. So uh, but, but the problem again we found was that when we talked to the farmers we have been informally tracking them since so, uh, since uh, last September, last November and some of the farmers have come back to us and said that when they go to the electricity department they are being told that they haven't got that circular from the groundwater department yet. So I think there is some issues with communication because it's a rather new act. So this time again day before yesterday we met with the government of West Bengal and we recommended that this change in law be advertised in newspapers and communication campaigns we launched and also the lower level officials of the electricity department be sensitized that this has happened and you're supposed to give connection to a farmer when he comes. So too early but I think the, the impact is likely to be quite quite huge and
we should be able to see it should be reflected in the secondary statistics within two or three years. This is an area with the alluvial aquifer and the aquifer as a whole acts like a sponge and if you dry or you know wring the sponge dry just before the rain falls then you are creating capacity for the rain to recharge that and this what I'm saying is a rather broad stroke there are a lot of different geological hydrogeological formations so yes we need to monitor it carefully the second point that I would say is that the farmers do not get free electricity unlike in other states here they would be paying a non-trivial charge for electricity actually they would be even paying more than the urban dwellers so basically there is no way a farmer is going to over extract over and above his crop requirements because he's paying an economic cost for that water so I think having a good regulatory system in place, electricity pricing in place is also somehow negating that implications of over exploitation.